are many great fighters that have never achieved what they should have achieved in the sport, not just in terms of legacy and titles, but financially as well. Yeah, I could certainly think easier ways to make uh, to make money and make a living. Uh, that's for sure. There's so much wasted talent. Um, there's so many guys talking, you know, sitting in pubs talking about how good they could have been if they maybe tried a bit um, or had the dedication. harsh truth is Henry people want to if you're popular people buy tickets to come see the fight how do you get pop popular is via being good but also it's, it's not always about being good I couldn't really think of a more certainly physically demanding career um, than that of a professional prize fighter um, and all of the stuff that comes with it I mean the business side of boxing as well uh, it's ridiculously tough and it's not anything I would advise anyone to get involved with. I get it, I like it, I cover it, but um, to reach that mountain top is nigh impossible. I've solved, I've solved a pro boxer, eh, Kieran? This is a life. What they don't see, you know what I mean? Yeah. What they don't see. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm a guy called Henry. A few months ago, I travelled to Glasgow in Scotland to meet professional boxer Kieran Smith. Uh, my aim was to make a documentary showing the time in a fighter's life when they're talented and undefeated but they can't get that next big fight to take them to the next level in their career. I wanted to further understand this period, the realities for a fighter in this situation and why they're in this situation. Everything was going well and then the coronavirus happened. Uh, we were all locked down um, and we've all been quarantining and isolating from one another um, and it's changed the way that I'm looking at this project. It's going to have an impact on the sport of boxing and we don't know what that is. So I'm going to use my time in quarantine to speak to some big names in the sport to try and learn more about this sort of who needs them club, this stage in Kieran's career that he's at, to try to understand more about it and how he might progress from it. I also want to look at how the coronavirus might impact the sport, um, both the positives and negatives. And from there, we'll, we'll see where we are. Okay, cheers. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. Um, Keenan Smith, 26, professional boxer um, and machine movement <laughs> specialist. <laughs> I'm 16 and all, fight a super welterweight and I've got the WBC international silver title. My name is Peter Lynch, um, I'm a professional boxing coach. Um, Kieran Smith is my brother-in-law, my employee and also I coach him as well. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Ross Stewart and I own a gym in Glasgow called Improve Glasgow and I've been looking after Kieran Smith's strength and conditioning for around about the last four years. Sport kept me probably out of trouble 90% of the time as a kid, the other 10% I was in the trouble but um, it could have been a lot worse. I just got up to things, kids got up to, but kind of the age of 14 boxing had taken over, taken over my life. Um, I was training in the garage when I was in the, in the boxing gym, 
I was out doing runs and my dad used to come on in the mornings and stuff like that and do three and four miles in the morning and stuff like that. Uh, it just kind of gradually took over my life and I loved it and it's been the same ever since. Me and Kieran obviously first met when Kieran was 12 year old, um, obviously when I started dating his sister. <laughs> He's actually my brother-in-law and the first thing I said to him was my sister introduced me to him and I says, anybody you know, I know better. And he just looked at me and was like that. <laughs> Kieran obviously was training the same gym as I was coaching in. I was coaching amateurs, Kieran was probably the other coach at the time when he was amateur until 2015 when he decided to turn professional and he asked me if I'd like to train him. I was asked when I turned professional, like, who, who do you want to, when I, I first made my first professional deal, like, who's going to be your coach? And I was like, I had to think about it and people would mention names and I was like, don't want to go there, don't want to go there. And I just sat up head down and said to him, I says, look, I says, I'm turning professional, I says, will you be my full-time coach? And he's like, aye. He's like, he said, if that's what you want, and, and I am, I think the, the, the biggest thing about um, Ped is he's not got a big ego. Whereas a lot of coaches have got big egos. They know everything, they, they, they've learned it all a hundred times over and if it's not their way, it's not right. Whereas me and Ped will stand in gyms and we'll have discussions about things and he's just constantly like learning new stuff. Whereas a lot of people get stuck in the rut and they, they think they know everything. So like the coaches ain't aren't learning anything else. Where times are changing, like things evolve, evolve or die like. Jack Brown clown, so and so and do with the orange pants. Ten years later now I'm rocking the orange pants. Kim was brought into my life by a Thai boxer that I used to train. Uh, he was the first pro athlete I started working with a long, long time ago. The two of them were friends and Primmy asked if he could bring Kieran down one day. I said that I'm too busy, he can come down if he trains with you. And then as luck would have it, Primmy stopped training, stopped competing, and I've had Kieran ever since. Uh, this session, Kieran's not in camp just now, so we had programmed uh, for him to start camp about four weeks ago, but now he's back working again. Uh, the training's a, a little bit of a mishmash at the moment, so at the moment we do some strength stuff at the start, we'll move into some higher rep stuff in the middle of the session and then we'll do, a, I'm going to jump in with them, we'll do a little bit of, of aerobic stuff towards the end uh, for, a, for a period of time, so at the, at the moment we're just playing around, you know, just keeping them busy. Yeah. Do, you enjoy, do you enjoy this kind of work, Kieran? I enjoy the work. Do you like it all? Well? No, I think. I enjoy it, it's good, it's good fun. Big tall guy though, it's hard to, hey? hard to master stuff like squatting, but since I came to Ross a few years ago, everything's improved. Drastically, eh, just learned so much more about my body probably. I mean, everything today, working, cutting weight, strength conditioning, looking after yourself in general, out with camp, hence why I'm here all the time. Things to note though is when we first started working together, you, you was just before you had a double knee operation, so you get both your knees reconstructed just before we started working. So, before when I first met here, and he could hardly walk on a straight line, <laughs> he, could, he could box well, but he could hardly walk on a straight line. Whereas now, now he moves like an athlete, right? That's good. I'm Josh Taylor, I'm the Unified Light Welterweight World Champion, IBF, WBA, Ring Magazine and the Muhammad Ali Trophy winner. And my name is Rob Tebbett, I am Managing Director of Boxing Social. My name is Joshua Gretzi, um, professional boxer, I've had 12 fights, 12 wins, 10 knockouts, um, previously uh, an Olympic bronze medalist. Uh, my name is Adi Oladipo, founder of Boxing Talk with Adi, uh, which has over 25,000 subscribers, over 1,000 videos on the channel so far as well. Um, aside from doing that, I work for Sky Sports. Um, I've interviewed some of their biggest stars, Anthony Joshua, Dillian White. Um, I work for CNN, I do ESPN Africa, Fox Sports, and now I do Talk Sport as well. I'm Carl Frompton, um, two-weight world champion, unified super bantamweight champion, hopefully gonna be a three-weight world champion, MBE also, also a doctor, also do magazines, Coolest man in the year 2015. In your opinion, how physically demanding is a career in boxing? 
you have to train, you have to give it 100%, you know, or you're just not going to get anywhere. Or you're going to get yourself potentially really hurt because you're not in as good shape as you could possibly be because you're maybe having to go to work and do this and do that on, on as well as train. You know, I'm lucky I'm, I'm able to train full time. But even then, you you need the weekends off because your body is in bits. You know, it's, it's very physically demanding. You know, you're training twice a day, sometimes three times a day. By the time Wednesday comes, you're, you you can hardly get out of your bed. You know, your your, your legs are tight. You can't bend down, touch your toes. Your back's tight. Your head's sore. The the training is. I mean, you have to be as fit as any, you know, as, as humanly possible. That's the thing with boxing. I mean, this is part of the reason why I have such love for it. I mean, it, there's no metaphors in boxing. There's no ball. There's no net. There's no stick. It's one man trying to impose his will on the other man and to do that you need to be as fit as physically fit as possible so it goes about saying that the training is very 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 difficult but the sacrifice they have to make i think you know what you get used to the pain but it's a lot of pain and it's is day after day so for example yesterday i went to the gym and um, this morning i had to get up to train and i thought i need a way out like i i don't think i can actually do this <laughs> And you know it is. It's, uh, you know it is, Henry. It's only a Tuesday, so I've got to do this till Friday. So it's day two already, and I'm thinking, why do I already feel like this? Maybe sometimes you have a bad day in sparring because you're tired, and mm. you maybe wake up the next again day. Your body's all sore. You've had a bit of a battering and sparring, and things like that. You know, but by the time Friday comes, you're you're knackered. You really mm. do need the, the two days rest. Um, it is very very physically demanding. Physically, it's obviously very difficult. I think boxers, for the most, and you hear when, when other sportsmen try a bit of boxing for a day and try to hit the pads or whatever, they talk about how tough it is. I think it's one of the most physically demanding sports to be able to go and fight for 12 rounds um, with a minute break in between is, is tough, it's pretty hard. The most important thing for me though is, is determination to succeed because the amount of people, and I still hear stories about all these people who, you know, beat me as an amateur, and I beat Brompton, and they're living off these stories, and it's nice, you know, it's well done, but they were better than me when we were kids, and they were better than me up until a certain age, but I just kept pushing on, and that's the only real difference. Like, there's more skilled fighters than me who haven't done half as much as I have, just because I have a bit more determination on them. It's not fun getting punched in the face so you know doing it day in day out um making way putting your body through hell missing your family missing your friends and your family and you know the the psychological aspect of boxing as well it's a very lonely sport you know i know a lot of fighters who who have their moments should we say when they're you know it is difficult they are um they are under immense pressure i almost feel like young kids and i don't know when you start to tell them this should know that physically a part of you will not be the same after boxing physically you will have some damage it's a damaging sport um it's an unforgiving sport you hear boxers talk about it all the time there are many great fighters that have never achieved what they should have achieved in the sport not just in terms of legacy and titles but financially as well um i think you know in life it doesn't matter whether you're a fighter whether you're in business you need a little bit of luck along the way and things have to go your way and you have to be willing and prepared to take the most of those situations as well and those opportunities and i think that's the best way to describe the life of a fighter everyone will get opportunities it's if you live the life if you prepare in the right way if you do the right thing and if you're good enough so i want to work out for kieran and i back cardio stuff to do he then scrubbed it out came up with his own workout which basically involved using every bit of equipment in the gym so the gym's not particularly busy, but there's three coaches in the gym who are now kicking off. The gear trying to take up the whole gym. And they're blaming me for that. So now, so now I've got, got to change that. You're redesigning the gym, Kira? You're redesigning the gym? Alright. Can you watch the business button? <laughs> Yeah, I've worked with a lot of athletes over the years uh, and obviously I'm a lot more general population people as well but uh, even, even comparison with the athletes, Kieran's a different level in terms of the work he puts in. 
With Kieran, it's not even necessarily what, what, what he's doing when I'm asking him to do stuff or when Ped's asking him to do stuff, because Ped and I speak about it, it's, it's the same in the boxing gym. It's, it's out with that. I'll say, take a, day, take a rest day. You've done, you've done enough, chill out, and then I'll go and run 10 miles, and then I'll, and then I'll, jump, in, I'll jump and do a, a swimming session in the evening. I, mean, I, I told you to rest, so I know, but I don't need to rest. And you know, for, for me, as a, as a coach, a lot of time spent trying to pull Kieran back and try to stop him from, from getting injured. I don't need to motivate him to train, that's for sure. Um, he doesn't need to get motivated. Um, it is more a fact of looking at him and, and assessing him to see if there's a, maybe a stage of fatigue kicking in. And you need to say to him, look, take a couple of nights off here and there to recharge the batteries. But apart from that, you know, I'll, I'll let him do what he does because that's what it, If Kieran takes a, a day off, he feels like he's, he's missed something, so he's missing out. So he wants to get back anyway, so I, I just let him train now. Kieran stays in, the, stays in camp right through. Um, he maybe has a wee, week or two off maximum. He maybe going to recharge the batteries, but apart from that, he's, he's, he's trained right through. And um, as he's getting older, he's actually staying in the gym even longer and longer, you know, because he wants to always improve. So it's good. It's all I've ever done. I, I still believe it's that's my trait today. Like I just work hard, and I don't believe I'm any more gifted than the next man. It's just it's just hard work, perseverance. Just keep pushing. Easy work. Hard enough for me. And it's a bit extra for him, so it's good. It's good that you support each other like that, you know. I don't know if I, I, don't, I didn't hear much support coming from him, did you? <laughs> All I heard was abuse. <laughs> So, Ped, this is uh, your company. Do you yeah. want to tell me what it's called and a little bit about it? Yeah, it's, it's called um, Lifting Services 24-7. Um, basically, we're a, we're a lifting company that's available 24-7. Um, and basically... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> basically, we move anything from a couple of hundred kilos to a couple of tonnes or ten tonnes into spaces that you think isn't possible and remove them from places you think isn't possible. Obviously, you're his coach. You're also his boss. That must be quite interesting, like, I guess it, it must be a bit weird for you because in an ideal world, he's not here, he's dedicated fully to boxing. Yeah, no, listen, he's, Keaton's um, got a good work ethic anyway, you know, so whatever he wants to do, he, he works hard anyway, so it's, he's a good help um, away from that, you know, but the other side is, listen, his main dream is to become a professional, a top level professional boxer, which, which hopefully he does one day, you know, Yeah. and given me being his coach and his boss, I can give him the flexibility to, to hopefully realise his dream, you know. That is very dangerous. fortunate. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess in a way though, like, the more he's in here, the less he's achieving his dream, right? Of course, of course it is. But at the end of the day, um, you know yourself, at this stage of his career, um, money, but at this level of boxers' career, they don't make a lot of money. Mm. So they've got to work sometime, they've got to make money somewhere, you know, and this mm. gives Kieran a chance to make some money as well. Mm. So he, he's still training away, he still trains after he's working, before he's worked, so it's, it's good as well. Well, I get asked still to this day. People ask me how much you get paid a week for being a boxer. It's crazy. They think it's like football. They think like you just get money handed to you every week. Like you just get a wage in your bank every week for being a professional boxer. It's it's absolutely crazy. Don't how no, they've, they've they've absolutely no idea how this sport works at all. Um, of course it's hard, but like these are the times that that make you. Um, like I say, I'm not going to complain about making money. Um, it's, it is what it is. And when I get the big opportunity, 
then I'll go full time again and I'll I'll take the right fight at the right time. What are you munching on my dad? The toro. Yeah. The potato crisps. This is the athlete's diet. It's athlete's diet. That's yeah. it. The tired athlete's diet. Yeah, tired <laughs> athlete's diet. Kieran, what you got? I've got a wee belt with a piece. Fucking Looks like a dog's dinner. Oh wow, look at that. Coconut curry, chicken, lentils, super green salad, beetroot. <laughs> if you look back to 2012 and said Kieran Smith's got the home of games in Glasgow, nobody would have believed you. Um, but I made it and I like it. I made sure it. I, I made sure that I was there. Um, just through hard work is just as, the same as I've kind of done through my whole career. As a professional, things went really well, and I had quite a big chance. Um, I was supposed to fight for the WBO European title in London a couple of years ago, and I got six stitches above my two weeks before it. I had a big, I got a big massive cut with an elbow and sparn. Totally accidental, but these things happen. I signed with MTK and things have been flowing since then. And it's just the start of this year. I'm trying to push on to big things and big titles. Tell me about your uh, your boxing career, Daz. Sure. Kieran, I'll you about Lazy. I always liked the war. It was alright. It was alright. Probably won as much as I lost, but. Got shafted a few times there and fucking jacked it. Yeah. Aye. A few shafts, one too many shaftings. What do you remember of Kieran from those times? I remember the day times. I remember watching Kieran when he was 16 boxing Felix Cash in the final of the British. Yeah, uh, boating and all that. Won out of the park. Uh, that was his British title. Uh, but you know, he, was always, he was always the best in the gym. He was fucking phenomenal. But then it was kind of the lead up to coming off games and all that. So I think there was four boys, field jam, three boys. Three, three, three Scott boys. I'm Scott Forrest and Big Ross Anderson. They were all got the coming off games, so the gym was buzzing, eh? Uh, the times it was a really good gym at that time. Mm. But um, I always just remember I'm training like it is it now. It's never, it's never been a, a problem with him training. Like, I used to train well, I used to go runs with him and all that, up hills and hill sprints and brutal. You didn't decide to keep it going yourself? Oh, fuck that. Ah, brutal. From a boxing perspective, I'm not a boxing purist, so I know he's very, very good. I don't know what the difference between a, a, a British champion boxer and a world champion boxer is, uh, but from what I understand, it, that, that he, is, he has all the makings of somebody who can make it all the way to the top. From a condition perspective and from a mentality perspective, the only thing that will hold him back is his boxing ability. So. For, for, for me, again, going back to the, the, the fulfilling your potential thing, you know, if, he, if he gets the British, British title level and he gets beat by a, by a better boxer, then fair enough, that's you, mate. you've reached a level, it wasn't your ability, you know, it wasn't your, your, your work ethic that held you back, it was your ability. Uh, for, for, for Kieran, it's never going to be his work ethic that, that, that stops him from making it to the next level. It will be his ability or, or the strength of his opponent. So I think he can make it as, as far as his ability will take him and how far his ability will take him, that's the, the boxing men to, to decide. His attribute says he's, he's 154 pounds, he's six foot two, he's a southpaw, he's got fast hands, he's slick, he's elusive. You know, that, it's very, very difficult to, to, to come against to get a, a fighter like that, you know. Listen, I think Kieran is very, very, very good. Um, and I think he will surpass British level, European level, I think he could complete. And I think he could go on world, world level in the very future, in the close future, maybe a couple of years down the line, I'd imagine they would. Mm -hmm. You've got to look at, like, see what Josh Taylor done. Josh Taylor, I believe, is maybe a couple of year older than Kieran. So why not in a couple of years' time be hitting the same, same heights where he is, you know? Yeah. And what's it been like for you, sort of, following his career? Good time. I've missed one of his fights when he was about 16, he'll tell you exactly. But I know what the fight it was, it was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I was working, I was working <laughs> up in Elgin, couldn't make it. It was, it was a Thursday night, Thursday night, I'm sure. It was an Andrew Sport Club and I missed that and he's never let me forget it. The boxers that seem to make the sort of big money or regular money or whatever, whatever you want to call it, tend to be the ones that have quite a big 
uh, act or character outside of the ring. Do you think it's fair that in boxing there's this expectation that you perform in and out of the ring? Yeah, I, I, yes, no, but it's a hard question to answer because yeah, you've got to have this big character and people love to hate people. That's what it is. People love to hate. So if you were this big character that's hated, people will know you because people actually love to hate. Whereas, like, I'm, I'm not saying people don't hate me, but I'm not a big, like, pretend character like that that just goes on and spraffs and I've not got the time to do it. I haven't got the time. Um, just talking nonsense constantly on social media and just acting like an idiot. You don't want to do it either because you want no, to be yourself, don't you? It's not me. Like, I'd, uh, it'd be different if that's how I ran about day to day life, but I don't. Like, I'm no five anymore. Um, I don't run about acting like a clown in day to day life. I'm just a normal guy. It feels like in boxing, it's the only sport where it's not purely a meritocracy. You know, you have these other sports like football and rugby and basketball where it's enough to just achieve your potential and be as good as you can. And if you do that, if you're good enough, you'll get to a certain level, you earn a certain amount of money. In boxing, it seems as though there's an expectation to perform outside of the ring as well as inside of the ring. What are your thoughts on that, on the fairness of it, on the pressures that come with it, and, and how do you think all this has evolved in the social media era? Um, that's, it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, initially, sort of, sort of 30 years ago, the promoter would just be that, promote you. There was none of that. You didn't need to do the self-promoting yourself. It helped, right? I mean, you look at people like Prince Nassim Hamed, it helped to self-promote, but that wasn't the be-all and end-all. You got in, done your job, and your promoter was the guy that was going to do everything behind the scenes. Now, fighters are asked not only to be a great boxer or a world championship boxer, not only to have their O remain intact, now you've got to go out there and speak like a Tyson Fury or a Conor McGregor or a WWE star. So, I mean, you compare that to other sports, right? No one's going to ask Mo Salah to jump on the mic and sell tickets for Anfield, right? That's done. Uh, but in boxing, you've not only got to be great in your sport, you've almost got to become something that you're uncomfortable with being. Yeah, I think you've got to have a wee bit, there's a bit of a pressure, you've got to have a wee bit of a character about you, um, a bit of personality about you, so so your fans can engage with you and sort of relate to you in a sort of, in some sort of level. And then, the, you know, I like that guy, I'm going to go and watch him fight, I want to see him yeah. doing well. Outside of getting your head down and winning fights, if, 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 if you're not a big social media star and that's not something that you're interested in doing or you're not very good at it, then you are going to have to take a longer path, potentially. Um, is it fair? No, but it's a business. Um, it's the same reason why, when it comes to football transfers, a football club will look at, OK, if I sign this player, then we're more likely to get X amount of revenue in this territory because he's a huge star over there. It's now a case of a competition of who can now talk the, the most trash. Some of these fighters don't want to do it. I can tell fighters they're uncomfortable doing it, but they've realized they have to do it. O'Hara Davis is one that's almost kind of molded into the guy that has to do that. He doesn't want to do that. You look at other sports like MMA, there's a guy called Henry Cejudo. This guy is an Olympic gold medalist. He's a two weight world champion in MMA. And this guy's having to come out with this gimmick now try and sell fights. He's had enough, he's retired. He said, I'm done, I can't do it no more. Um, it, it's ridiculous, it, it's ridiculous. But in the era of social media, these fighters do need to understand that they do need to create a social media presence. Does mm. that mean changing your character to become a WWE-like character? No, but you do need to have a social media presence. You've got to. You get prospects, good prospects coming through that you know, have not got the promoter with the TV rights. So they're not able, the promoters are not interested in having a show for them because yeah. they've not got TV rights or, you know, they're maybe not selling enough tickets and you know, things like that, so it can be hard. So a lot of the time, these fighters go unnoticed. They've got maybe the belts, but they're, they're, they're going unnoticed because they're not getting the fall in the back end. But mm. I think with the now, with the power of social media, if you've got a couple of these belts, domestic belts or, you know, sort of interim belts and things like that, continental belts, these are belts that should get you in the rankings and do put you in the rankings but then you can use your social media to then call out fighters you know mm. maybe not be disrespectful but you know say alright if this is the guy I want to fight I think I'll beat him up I'll beat his ass I'll whoop him up and you know you've got to cause a wee bit a wee bit of a, a wee bit 
controversy to to get your name out there. Like he's calling me out, and you know, and then that's yeah. what then sparks the the rivalry and the thing which creates public interest. And what would you say to fighters that don't really want to do that? Do it, um, because if you want to progress and you're not getting to where you want to go, then do it, because that might be the only the way that you might get people talking about you and get people taking notice of you, and mm. you know. Oh, it builds up yourself and your fights and stuff like that. It's the power of social media, and, and it does it does definitely work for a lot of people. I know there's some people who maybe just aren't into that, and they want to rely on on their skill and ability to get them to the top. But I don't think it's enough, and that's mm. that's harsh, but it's true. Um, even if you're you are that type of character who doesn't like it, um, who you know, some people feel like they're a bit it's a bit show offy, whatever. You know, maybe think about getting someone else to do it for you, someone else to run it for you. Um, I think it's extremely important to be able to promote yourself on, on these social media platforms. I just think it's life, isn't it? I mean, you've got to be interested. It's, it's not rocket science to know that if you're not interested, if you don't have a story, and it's not just your job. I mean, if you've got a good promotional team, it's our job. I'm your mouthpiece, right? So, you know, if you're any top fight with me, I'm the one and our guys are the one and our machines are the one who are pumping your brand, your profile 24 seven when you're sleeping, when you're in the gym. It's gonna take too much out of you to do that yourself. Some guys are great self promoters and I look particularly at where it can start to affect you. I look at the Deontay Wilder fight against Tyson Fury. Now Deontay Wilder's come out with about 462 excuses so far. But one thing I do believe is he doesn't have a promoter, right? So he is constant. Like they, they, they really push those guys to the wire of delivery. You know, whether it's messages on YouTube, phone calls, press conferences, talk shows, etc. Fury the same. You know, Fury, but Fury does have Bob Arum. He does have Frank Warren. He does have MTK. So he has these voices as well that are, that are moving this machine around. Deontay Wilder, although he has PBC, has no individual speaking up for him. So feel that sometimes you can do too much. You have to remember your fundamentals in sport, in business, and what are the basic things you have to do to perform. And sometimes you can move out of that zone, you can start getting a little bit carried away. Yeah, I'm my own promoter. That's why I hate fighters to say, I've got my own promotional company. What are you talking about? No, you haven't. It's just a, it's just a company. It's like I always joke with Charlos, you know? Yeah, we are lions only. All right, lions only. So when you do a show and it loses a couple of million, are you going to stick in half as a co-promoter? No, you don't want that life. You don't want that responsibility. It sounds good, doesn't it? But the reality is, you're a fighter. You know, I'm not going to start going, oh, well, actually, I've been thinking about it. I reckon I can get in there myself and throw a few left hooks. I can't fight. You can't run a promotional company. So let's just have it real. This is the way it is. And there's got to be a synergy. But there's got to be that feeling of sort of, you know, that mutual respect between a fighter and a promoter to know what you're good at. And and I'm not saying that fighters shouldn't develop their own brands and have their own companies. Of course they should, but let's just get it real. We do what we do, you do what you do. Together, if we get it right, we'll go all the way. But if you work as hard as you can and I work as hard as I can, I'll present you with the opportunities and you will have every chance to succeed. You are right about social media. Fighters do have to do more, you know? And some fighters work very hard on their social media and it helps. I mean. A good example is probably Ryan Garcia, you know, who's built his entire following through Instagram. He ain't had a proper fight yet, you know, and he's one of the biggest names in the sport already. So I like a solid social media campaign and presence backed up with a great work ethic and a lot of talent. And, and with, with that combination, you're in a good spot. Ken's not one for, for shouting out names, to be honest. Um, we have discussed about it. And at the end of the day, we don't shout about names on social media, or Kieran doesn't shout out names on social media. But behind the doors, he has spoke to his management and he has asked for fights. Listen, there's, there's less talented fighters than that shout their mouths off um, every day. And to be fair, it seems to work for them. Um, you know, it's, I think it's more than entertainment and try to get the fans in. If that's what you want to do and you, you can make money out of it, then why not? That's the way I see it. If that's, the way, if that's our personality, um, these people do tend to get found out in the ring, though. Most of them can't really back it up, for what I've seen anyway. How important is your diet and nutrition? Diet and nutrition getting it on point. How hard is and how hard is it to keep it going? Like with working a full time job like this, most people want to like binge you at the end of the day. Oh, of course, I. It's hard. Like 
He's brought he's brought a piece today for the first time. I don't know how long. Like he's snack, snack bands and McDonald's and they're eating they, they, do. they eat so many crap like when they get a minute to stop. Right. And I've just got a piece of me. But it's this is really bother me this year. Yeah. It's hard some days. Yeah. And how hot and like obviously you don't have a fight booked at the moment. Is it difficult? Is it more difficult when you don't have that goal to work towards? Probably. I, mm, not so what. I've always kind of said, I train all the time. But I've always said like to people, people that always ask me like, how do you do that? Now I'm like, cause I need to do it. Like, of course it would be hard like a normal person to be religiously sticking to a diet all the time and. Stuff like that, they're like, oh, I could never do it. I'm like, well, if I was you, I could never do it either, probably. Mm. But um, it's all about the end goal, isn't it? Yeah. So you still have the belief that, like, it is all going to pay off eventually? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you didn't, if you didn't, If you didn't have that. If no. If you didn't have if that. If no, I'll be helping if... Why not? <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't have that belief, do you think that you would keep going with it all? Nah, if I didn't have that belief, I'd probably wouldn't have been pro. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. See, for you guys, from your perspective, mm-hmm. obviously, like, Kieran's ability is not really in doubt for people that know about him. Aye. But as, as his mate, do you ever sort of worry that it's not going to happen? I don't know. I mean, I know boxing as well, and I know the politics of it, and I know it's not easy to, it's not easy to get these shots, but... For some people it happens, for some people it doesn't, eh? But look, Kieran works as hard as anybody I know, so I've no doubt that one day there will be a big a big shot, a mm-hmm. big title. Hopefully, no, no, hopefully because it'd be good for us all to go to it as well. Well, that would be the real travesty, wouldn't it? Seeing how hard he works, the way he lives his life, the diet, the dedication. For if he didn't get a shot, what would, no, that, no, no. what would that say about the sport? Tells its own story, doesn't it? Right. it? Tells its own story. That's, I mean, I think your face needs to fat as well at times because, like, see, Kieran, it's not, it's maybe not that he's avoided, but like, it's a big risk fight for the likes of matchroom boys, and that's where you need to be. You need to be boxing on like matchroom shows and stuff like that to get, to get the big, uh, the big fights. But why they've got to let a fighter six foot two southpaw? I don't know, fifty four pounds. Know what I mean? I'm in the, the Who Needs Them club a bit um, for, for people and the, the very top that are, that are trying to push on again, like, why would they want to fight me? Um, risk versus reward, um, big risk, low rewards for them, and I understand that. Um, if, I was, if I was in their position, I'd probably be, be the same as well because they want to push on even further. So, it's just a... It's a rock and hard place, isn't it? Bigger names in, in boxing with potentially the bigger followings probably don't want to fight Kieran because it, it's, a, it's a tricky fight for them and there's not necessarily a big upside. But then with Kieran, what, what's, what's he supposed to do? Continue fighting, fighting journeymen for, forever? You know, it's, it's, it's difficult. Boxing, there's a lot of politics in boxing. Um, a lot to do with which promoter you're signed with and things like that. I mean, I don't think promoters, your Eddie Hearns doesn't like to put your, these fighters in with Frank Warren's fighters, etc. Kieran's sitting with no, non-promoter at the minute, no promoter at the minute, so he's just on a management contract with MTK. So it's just like waiting on the shout, you know? That's all we're waiting on, waiting on the shout to get a big fight. In boxing today, there's this concept of the sort of who needs them club. You know, these fighters who are talented and undefeated and trying to take themselves to the next level with a big fight, with the right name, but they just haven't got the commercial pulling power to do that. Um, what's your advice to these fighters and how would you suggest they kind of take their careers to the next level? I think unless you can sell tickets, you'll just need to touch lucky and you know, you'll need a lucky break, maybe step in last minute or something like that and beat up a prospect, um, maybe on TV. Um, and I think that's, it just shows you the importance of, of selling tickets because I wasn't, I was never one of them guys as the who needs them. 
because I'd always sold a ticket. So a promoter is always going to give me a chance because it's helping to lay in their pocket. But if you've got extremely good fighters who don't sell a ticket, um, why would a promoter put him in against a guy who does sell tickets who isn't as good as him and he could potentially beat him? It, you know, it's like... I don't know. It's it's a hard one to explain, but I suppose that's the business side of boxing. The thing is, Henry, I'm a beneficiary of someone that went through the amateur system, did well, and is benefiting now as a professional. But the reality is that not everyone, you know, has that um, not success rate, but not everyone has that um, exposure. Um, like you said, some fighters are very good; they're undefeated, but no one's heard of them. In terms of um, professional. Of course, he's a good fighter, he's, he's got good potential and stuff, but I don't think um, my name really got put on the map until I fought the likes of Ahara Davis. I yeah. think that was the one that put my name out there and, and people started taking notice. So mm. you've got to be lucky in terms of um, competition and rival rivalry. You know, you've got to have a bit of rivalry there where people are going to get engaged, engage in the pre fight build up. Mm. Um, again, you've got to have you know a good promoter has got some tv rights as well so all that comes into play as well if you've got a rivalry there and the tv rights and and you can make these fights happen then that that can be that can be a lot of people start then get talk about your name i can't tell you how much it frustrates me um and it frustrates me because i see these boxers i speak to these boxers quite a lot and they could be ranked number 20 and no one wants to give them a crack because they are a risk but they're not a ticket seller so it's almost like, well, why am I going to give my boxer a chance against him? If he beats my boxer, who is he? And that's not how it should work. It should be like a f***ing league table. You, 20 fights 19, he jumps to eight, and that's how it should be. Um, but boxing isn't like that because we don't have a world governing body. We've got all these frank, all these sanctioning bodies that are clearly fractured and don't want to work with each other. Mm. All these um, television companies and promoters that don't want to work with each other. So everyone literally just picking what they want from it. And you get good boxers on the outside who maybe don't have a flash promoter, not signed to an Eddie Hearn or, or a Lou DiBella or a Bob Arrow who's, who can talk well, and they're just left fighting for scraps because no one wants to give them a chance because they can't. How can you not be given a chance because you can't sell f***ing tickets? Mm. It, like, what? Look, man, life's not fair. But it's not to say it can't be done. If you look at Terence Crawford, who's one of the pound for pound best fighters in the world, pay-per-view fighter, you know, he's a seven-figure fighter. He's not, you know, he's not Muhammad Ali on the microphone. He's not Conor McGregor. He's not Floyd Mayweather. Ultimately, his skill set is what's brought him to the top table, and he's had to win, and he's had to had to keep his place there by winning and his skills. Um, would it have been a, a bit easier if he could talk on the microphone like Conor McGregor? Of course, but. You know, not everybody's like that. I know fighters, you know fighters, everybody can name at least one fighter who hasn't been given opportunities that they deserve or, or, or are too good for their own good. I mean, boxing has this kind of, again, a misconception of protecting the O. You know, fighters aren't willing to give somebody the opportunity to take their O unless they're bringing something to the table. If you don't sell tickets, you don't have a big audience and people don't know who you are, how are you supposed to entice somebody into the ring? which is when you get fighters who have a lot of talent and a lot of ability, but maybe not the opportunity, they will only really get an opportunity if the, the deck is stacked heavily against them. So they'll get an opportunity, but they might only get two weeks to train. They might have to cut a lot of weight. They'll go and have to fight on the A-side promoters, sh uh, the A-side fighters show. Uh, they'll get paid less than they would have got or that they deserve. Winning is one thing, but like you said, entertaining. It's also another thing because there's some fighters that when they get to a certain level, they may lose, but the fans find them entertaining. Whether it's because they know they come with that fan-friendly style, which doesn't always win, um, or whether they know, okay, this guy, he's going to come and put it all on the line. Or whether it's like, actually, this guy is a very funny personality on social media, so actually, I want to see him fight, whether he's going to win, lose or draw. Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, there's a lot of it that goes behind it. And like you said, there's pressure to win not this pressure not only to win but to win in style um but you know what it is i think this is all part of, it's all part of the package um i don't think any boxer is necessarily exempt for, from it 
those fighters that, you know, the who needs them club have started to become very attractive to promoters because they move quicker than others. You know, a good example of those in the past is Gennady Golovkin, you know, who I can't tell you was in the biggest who needs them club for so many years where I had, I, w I was avoiding him for my fighters. You know what I mean? Like, I'll be honest, who would fight Gennady Golovkin? Because at the time, he didn't have an HBO contract. At the time, he wasn't filling arenas. So there was no benefit to fight Gennady Golovkin other than, and he didn't even have a, you know, a, a mainstream belt at that time either. When you look at it now, I feel like promoters have started to look at those, you know, who needs them fighters and say, well, hang on, if these guys are willing to move faster, another good example of two guys that we represent at the moment is Israel Madrimov, the 154 pounder, who's had a handful of fights and was already ranked number two with the WBA. And also MJ, uh, Akhmad Aliyev, who's just beaten Danny Roman for the unified super bantamweight title. But these are two guys from Uzbekistan, right? And they come, yeah, you can say that, oh, the who needs him club. That's just an excuse for lazy promoting. That's just an excuse for not thinking outside the box. If you can fight, if you're entertaining, then I can sell it. Of course, you know, if a fighter has a promoter, they're in a very strong position, however, there are unsigned fighters. What would you say to them? How would you advise them? What kind of pathway is there for them? And, and how would they go about getting a promoter if that is the only way? Very difficult. You have, you have to get noticed. You have to get seen. And generally that comes by your performance. It doesn't matter if you're on a small hall show. If you're a good fighter, if you're knocking people out, you will get noticed. Don't worry about that. In terms of your progression with the governing bodies, again, it's not rocket science. The governing bodies that have more fighters in those divisions, that pay more sanction fees, that have better relationship. It's not corrupt, it's just life. They're gonna have a better chance of getting their fighters ranked. So if you're, a, if you're a young, unsigned fighter, my advice to you is keep knocking people out, keep looking entertaining, keep banging the drum, and you will get seen. There is no high quality fighters on a small hall circuit that don't get recognized. Simple as that. I know every fighter on the small hall circuit. And if there's one that I believe can go away, I'm swarming all over him like a fly. He's really at the stage where he, he needs to get the chance now um, for his head mentally, because he pushes himself that hard in the gym. But I think now he needs the opportunity so that it's not wasted. He's, he goes gets to the right time, you know. Kieran and I have had a lot of conversations over the last couple of weeks, and, and ultimately, he's an athlete who's in his prime. And an athlete who's in his prime needs to keep his head in the game and needs to, to push through the, 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 the current moment of hardship that, that he's faced with, of just constant inactivity, constant uncertainty as to when the next fight's going to, going to be or not going to be. Uh, he needs to keep his head in the game. He's not 35. He's also not 18. He's banging in the middle of his prime. Uh, he, he should be further ahead than what he is, than where he is at the moment. And if it had it not been for cuts and injuries to both himself and opponents, I believe that he would be further ahead. Uh, he's, he's just got to keep his head in the game. It's, it's a really important time that, that is testing him, but I think he'll come out the other side of this test stronger. Well, it's very frustrating because I believe that styles make fights. Um, and I, I'm, listen, I think once the right fight comes, when Kieran gets stepped up a level, that's when we'll see the best of Kieran, which hopefully we get the Commonwealth title or even a British title shot. And I think we'll see the best of Kieran in their fights. What I wanted the supporters to always be able to say, I, I gave it my best, like, and that's whether I make it or not make it. Whereas people are, are scared of that. People want to kind of beat around the bush and then they, they don't want to find out if, what they actually have. Whereas I want to find out, I want to find out what, like, what, where I can go here. And I want to turn around and say, like, I gave everything.
So finally, um, just thoughts on the coronavirus. We're doing this via video link today um, because we've all been locked down, we're all in quarantine. We don't know what's gonna happen with boxing. What are your thoughts on how it might impact the sport, um, short term, long term, and how you think it might affect the sort of who needs them club? I think the small hall shows are, are gone for the foreseeable. How does, how does a small hall promoter put on a show? They, most of the time, these guys lose money because they don't have the TV money coming in. So if you can't sell a ticket because of coronavirus, how are you going to make money unless you're on TV? So I think small hall shows are just going to be a thing of the past for the foreseeable future anyway. It could end a lot of careers prematurely because this, these shows aren't happening and yeah. folk are having to get money in the bank and go back to work and stuff like that you know it's a uh, I, I feel that you know what keeps the sport alive is folk coming through and journeyman and you know middle middle sort of grassroots sort of level sport is it keeps it keeps the sport alive and there's only mm. a handful of fighters at the top at the top that are making big money um, you can sort of see the desperation now in their eyes where they've not had a fight for four months and we're used to seeing these guys fight once or twice a year. I yeah. think boxers, and I'm talking the top level ones now, will fight three, four times a year, like it used to be in the 90s. Um, just because they don't ever want to go through this period again. Now, long term, it, I mean, it's de it depends when we get crowds back, if there's a vaccine. Um, I really don't know. Uh, I think that the major fights, um, the major pay-per-view fights, kind of your, your heavyweight title fights, will go uh, abroad to places where you can have a you can have a crowd. Um, now, Wilder Fury three talk is of it going to China, um, Joshua Pulev, Middle East, um, and then beyond that, really, it's kind of who knows. Yes, we know there is no gate to generate the revenue that will stop you from making those pay-per-view fights, or certainly the fights in between a really good Saturday night fight night and a pay-per-view. You know, the likes of the Callum Smiths, the Josh Warringtons, you know, the Billy Joe Saunders, these kind of people. Because without pay-per-view of those fights, it's so difficult to generate revenue. Josh Warrington, great example. If we did Josh Warrington against Kanzu, which is a fight that's planned, the unification fight, we would take a million and a half pounds on the gate. There's no gate. So we're a million and a half light. 
So who's going to swallow that? I don't mind swallowing some. I ain't swallowing the whole lot. There's going to be fighters who have to take risks as well. Um, there may be fighters who have been guided along kind of carefully, fighting guys, knocking them over, looking good, making a few quid. But now I think it's going to get to the point because of this pandemic that promoters are saying, for exciting fights on the TV, you have to take a bit of a risk. A lot, a lot of the times, um, these domestic rivalries don't happen because folk are chasing bigger fights and this and that, and the boxing mm. politics get in the way, and and you you miss out on what I believe are most nine times out of ten the most cracking fights are like the small hall shows and yeah. domestic rivalries. They're mm. always always good dust ups and good fights, and yeah. you, you can't beat fights like that. The good news for fight fans is you're going to see a lot more competitive fights. You're going to see a lot more domestic fights as well. Fight Camp, which looks like will start at the end of July, is a great example of just that. And we've only got five fights on each card, which is the same as any broadcast you'd ever see. But normally we would have another five fights that would happen before that. And they would give us opportunity to build prospects or put the one-sided fights on, try and keep them off TV. Now, with only five fights a night and five broadcast fights, I can't afford a poor fight. So, and you know, I want the five fights to be as close to they can be as 50-50 across the board. What would you say to someone who's in the sort of position we talked about today, who's struggling in their career, they don't know where they're gonna go, they don't know what lies ahead? Stay ready, always stay in shape. And if the opportunity arises, you have to take it, and it's about taking risks as well at the right time. I had a few risky fights in my career, and I took them, and I've succeeded. It's about taking these calculated risks and hopefully they pay off. Keep keep doing what you can do at home. Keep yourself in good shape. I mean, it opens up a little bit. You get back to training with the, your coaches and sparring again. You're in, you're you're hitting the room running because you're in, you're in good shape. So keep on it and and let's do it. When, once you have life, then there's always hope. When you die, there's no hope because it means you're dead. But when, once there's life, there's always hope. And I think for the fighters that can't get the fights that they want or the opportunity that they want, just remain positive. Your breakthrough will come, but it just it's just a matter of being consistent. Again, I'll sit back here and I'll say to you, it's very easy for me to give all these talks and to say, be positive, do this, do that. But um, that's, all the, that's all that can be done. Just remain consistent in what you're doing. Um, your breakthrough will come, man. Your breakthrough will come. And, and these fighters, they'll be ready to take it. Unless they're fighting me, because I'll always be ready. Let me get that in there. <laughs> I just think stay positive. You know, it's easy to say stay positive. It's not just fighters. There's a lot of people in the same boat. You know, um, there's a lot of businesses that have huge amount of costs monthly, you know, with no revenue, no income coming in. Some people that are unemployed, some people that are struggling to deal with this mentally. You just got to take each day as it comes. You know, when you're struggling mentally, I think the best solution is just to keep life simple. Don't overthink things. Don't start thinking about the future. Where am I going? What's my long-term strategy, medium-term strategy? Short-term strategy. Wake up, write down five things you've got to do today and tick them off one by one. And when you complete that, you will get that sense of fulfillment, get that sense that you're moving in the right direction. Do the fundamentals right, live life right, and work as hard as you can. They are the basic rules to make sure that you will find success. Take the risk, roll the dice, the opportunity will come. And I think those guys need to just knuckle down now. This is the time now where you start to realize who's been training behind closed doors and who's been sitting down eating pizza and drinking beer. I think the <laughs> who need you guys clubs would have been training their asses off, just waiting for the opportunity. And I think that phone call is gonna come very soon for all of them. And I think they're gonna surprise a lot of people. Well, Thanks very much. Remember, the tide always turns. The tide always turns. I hope so. Good luck, mate. Cheers, mate. Thanks. All right, Kieran, what you got there? The stewards decided to put the above final eliminator contest to post bids to be submitted in accordance with the terms and conditions of the board's head office by 12 noon on Wednesday, the 8th of April 2019. Contest to take place by the end of July 2020. Kieran Smith version Anthony Fowler. So that's an email. Is that an email from the British board? It's just came out in the British Boxing Board of Control's website. So um, 
as I think it's a monthly thing, isn't it? It's a notice. No, it's just a it's notice. Just a notice. So, what do you think about that? Sorry, what do you think about that? Um, hopefully it comes off, but I won't hold my breath. Um, there's just that many different routes in boxing now. Um, it's not a mandatory fight for um, any of the matchroom boys either. So, who knows? What do you think, Paul? Is that pretty much it? I mean, the possibility that the fight can happen, um, depending on what Mr. Hearn decides he's route for Anthony Fowler, and um, I would think he's trying to make the fight for Scott Fitzgerald against Fowler. Um, and the board have probably said here, there's other guys within the mix, James Metcalf, Kieran Smith, they have to be there, or there or thereabouts, to get their opportunities. So. I think it's good from the board that they've done something like that. So hopefully uh, something comes of it at mm. some stage. Mm. So we're just keeping our fingers crossed this could be a, a real opportunity. Uh, Is this the kind of thing you get quite a lot though? Do you get opponents thrown around and then and then nothing happens kind of thing? I've n not by the board, but mm. obviously by just management side and asked about different opponents and stuff like that. So, so this opportunity so. could potentially be something a bit different from what's been hopefully. talked about before. Hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed for you both. Paul? The cream always comes to the top. You've reached the end of the documentary. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, first of all, please subscribe to Motivedia. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, hit the notification bell. Like the video. Share it with your friends or whoever might want to watch this. Um, and all that good stuff. Um, I'm a guy called Henry. Please go and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's a guy called Henry. Um, my social media is at a guy called Henry. All the links will be in the description. Also, please go and follow Kieran Smith. Um, across social media. His links will also be in the description. Cheers guys, have a good day.